One of the coolest things about bull snakes is the huge variety of colors they come in. However, there is some confusion regarding the terminology to all of these morphs. So today we are going to try to clear up some of that confusion by explaining to you the different morphs of bull snakes there are. Today I'm only going to be covering proven genetic morphs. This means that we will not be covering locales or line bred traits. Locales are when a, a kind of an isolated group of an animal or of a species ends up evolving to look different than the rest of their population because they're so isolated for so long. An example of this would be the dark coloration of Kankakee bull snakes, which are located in Kankakee, Illinois. Line bred traits are when an individual snake has a desirable appearance, like say a red colored bull snake appears, you breed that into the next generation, it's not a genetic morph so it doesn't behave like your recessive traits do, but you can increase your odds of getting another red in the future by breeding it to its offspring, basically. So you're breeding for a specific trait in the same family tree to increase your odds of getting another one. That's basically what line breeding is. So again, we will not be covering the locales or line bred traits. Interestingly enough, all of the genetic traits seen in bull snakes, at least to date of this video, are all recessive traits. There aren't any codominant or dominant mutations in bull snakes. Because of this, today we're just going to be talking about all of the recessive traits that are seen in them. We'll start by talking about single genetic mutations, and then we'll dive into two gene combos and three gene combos and so on. What I have in my hand here is just a normal or wild type coloration bull snake. This is a gorgeous pattern and color. I love the wild type bulls, and honestly, they're one of my favorite color morphs, even though they're really not a morph. This is just how they appear in the wild. You just have these beautiful brown blotches down their backs, which vary in coloration from their head towards Towards their back and then towards their tail. It seems like they go from dark colored to light colored to dark colored again, at least in our Minnesota or Wisconsin area bull snakes. So the first genetic mutation I'd like to cover in today's video is one that you're probably all aware of. It is the albino gene. And by the way, I'm going to be using the terms gene, morph, and mutation all kind of interchangeably in this video. Albinism causes a complete lack of the pigment melanin. Melanin is the pigment that creates the black coloration in the scales of snakes. However, snakes get their color from more than just one pigment. The melanin only affects the black coloration of their scales, so that's why albinos, at least in the snake world, still show off their yellow and orange pigmentations. Albinism only affects the pigment melanin. Snakes do have melanin in their eyes, so that's why the black coloration is removed from them, and instead you're left with a red color. Eye. Honestly, I think albino snakes are gorgeous because they're not pure white like a lot of albino, say, mammals are. Since they still get their color from different pigments, they have tons of color still in their scales, even if they're an albino. The next genetic mutation I'd like to cover is the azanthic mutation, and this is a gorgeous morph of bull snake. The azanthic trait basically restricts the yellow pigmentation, and without yellow coloration, you're left with kind of a grayscale looking snake. This isn't to be confused with anorithristic snakes, or anery snakes for short, which is a gene that restricts red pigmentation. In corn snakes, you often see kind of black and white or grayscale snakes being referred to as aneries, and in the bull snake world, since it's the yellow pigmentation that's affected instead of the red, they are called azanthic morphs. But this is where some of the confusion starts to set in. For bull snakes, there are actually two different strains of azanthic. There's your Miami Co. and your Omaha, also known as the Balam azanthic. These two are not compatible with one another. So if you were to take, say, a Miami Co. azanthic and breed it to an Omaha or Balam azanthic, all of their babies would look normal because those two genes aren't compatible with one another. However, all of those babies would be double het or heterozygous for both strains of of azanthic. Next up, the white-sided morph. This one is pretty self-explanatory. The sides of the snake are white, and it's actually our first pattern mutation of this video. With all snakes, you have color mutations, which affect the color, and pattern mutations, which, of course, affect the pattern of the snake. With the white-sided mutation, I mean, as you can see, his sides are pretty white, but you might also notice that his colors seem to be a little more grayscale than a normal wild type. That's because the white-sided gene in bull snakes, anyway, also has a bit of an azanthic component to them. So the white side of gene affects both pattern and color. It's kind of a weird one, and this adds a ton of confusion to morph combinations, which we're going to get into later. 
the white-sided mutation has different levels of quality with bull snakes. You have some individuals that have very clear-cut white sides and others that have more of a color gradient from their back to their belly. This snake is one of those white-sideds that has more of that gradual change of coloration. The next morph on today's list is another pretty self-explanatory one. It's the patternless mutation. Basically, they have no pattern. They have just a very clean look to all of their scales. There's no splotches whatsoever. Their bellies are even clean and there aren't even any spots on their head. There is absolutely no pattern on the patternless mutation. This individual though is also a hypo so that's why he's a little bit brighter than just a plain old patternless bull snake would be. We're gonna get more into the two gene combos here pretty soon but this is the only patternless bull snake I have so it's the only one I could use for this video. But if you want to know what just a plain old patternless bull snake looks like imagine him but a slightly darker brown. Okay, those are the easier morphs to understand. Now really start paying attention because it gets kind of confusing. This is a hypo bull snake or a hypomelanistic. Hypo means less or fewer of. So if you have a reptile with hypovitaminosis A, it has a lack of vitamin A in its diet. Hypomelanistic means the snake has a lack of melanin, which again produces black pigmentation. So they don't have a complete lack of melanin like albinism or albino snake do. So that's why they still have black tongues and black eyes, as well as a lot more brown coloration in their scales. A lot of people think hypo means more yellow, and you do see a lot more yellow in their scales, but that's just because there's less black, so the yellow tends to pop a bit more. The confusing part about hypo bull snakes is that there are currently two known strains of hypomelanism. This is a Trumbauer hypo bull snake. The term Trumbauer comes from the last name of Craig Trumbauer, who is the breeder who first discovered this morph. He was just breeding bull snakes and all of a sudden one of his babies hatched out as a hypomelanistic individual. So his strain of hypo bull snakes was called the Trumbauer hypo. And that has been bred into many, many generations and is seen all over the bull snake community today. The Trumbauer hypo is a really nice, true version of a hypomelanistic animal because with particularly nice specimens of this morph, you don't see like any black pigmentation anywhere except for in their eyes and their tongue. Some though do have maybe like really dark browns that might almost appear black, especially near their tail. But instead of dark brown or black spots down their back or blotches, it's just this gorgeous like golden brown color instead. The second strain of hypomelanism is called the Stillwater Hypo. This one, though, is debatable on if it's actually a type of hypo or not. As you may have already noticed, this snake has a lot of black pigmentation and attitude behind her head, as well as near her tail. And in between, there's a lot of browns, but I'd say this is more of just a cool pattern morph and maybe a slight color morph, but not really an example of hypomelanism because there's just too much black pigmentation. And there's a lot of other bull snake breeders who think the same thing. Uh, others think it is a true hypo, so there is a little bit of debate here. I personally don't think this is an example of a hypomelanistic animal. Instead, I think we should just call it the Stillwater morph, not Stillwater hypo. From what I understand, the Stillwater morph gets its name from long ago. There was a rattlesnake roundup over just across the river from where we live in uh, Stillwater, Minnesota, and that's where they collected a bunch of rattlesnakes as well as probably a misidentified rattlesnake that ended up being a gravid bull snake, which was then taken into captivity alive. It laid eggs and those were the first Stillwater babies, for Stillwater hypo babies. So I think these were all derived from just across the river from where we live. Oof. She doesn't like that idea. That pretty much covers all of the single gene mutations that you see in bull snakes. So now let's talk about what happens when you combine two of them together. Two gene combos are often just referred to as the two genes involved in that snake, say a hypo albino bull snake. However, a lot of them have a different name altogether that's been coined for those two genes being combined. It sounds kind of confusing, I just realized, so let's just dive right into it. This is Mr. Wilson. We've had him for quite a while. He is a combination of hypo, Trumbauer hypo, and albino. So you could call these either a sun glow or a hybino. I prefer the term hybino because it's easy to remember what's involved with that name, whereas sun glow is a different term altogether. In my opinion though, the hybinos don't look much different than albinos because if you think about how those genes work, albino and hypo, Hypo reduces the amount of melanin and albino takes it away altogether. So I think albino just kind of takes 
over the morph of the snake. You might see a little bit more like brighter reds in their scales or kind of a lighter yellow coloration overall, but I don't, and maybe that's affected by the hypo, but really hypomelanism only affects the black pigmentation melanin. So overall, hybinos pretty much look just like albinos. Another thing I've noticed is that combining hypo and albino seems to wash out the pattern of certain individuals. This is a hybino that we produced right here, so we know it's genetics. It is Trumbauer hypo and albino. The previous one I showed you is actually this one's dad. And as you can see, there's like no pattern at all a very, very little pattern on this snake. But that could really just be a coincidence with the individual snake that I have. But there does seem to be some variability in hybinos. Next, let's talk about what happens when you combine hypo with white-sided. This is what you get. This is a beautiful color of bull snake, in my opinion. It was originally, when it was first produced, called a ghost morph. And then, several years later, a hypo was paired with an azanthic morph, and that created something that looked pretty similar to this. And if you remember from earlier in this video, the white-sided gene has a bit of an azanthic component. So that's why when you mix hypo and white-sided, it looks very similar to when you mix hypo and azanthic. There just might be a little bit of pattern difference thanks to the white-sided, removing some of that lateral pattern. And this is where it gets really confusing with bull snake morphs. And it's actually the reason why we did this video in the first place. So once the hypo and azanthic form of a bull snake was produced, that was then termed ghost, and this one, the original ghost, was coined the false ghost. Basically, since this snake, this false ghost now, it consists of hypo and white-sided, the white side isn't a true azanthic morph. Instead, the white side just happens to affect the color, but it's really a pattern morph. It makes white sides on the snake. It re removes the pattern on their sides. Whereas the azanthic morph actually does target the coloration and it reduces the yellow pigmentation in particular. It doesn't do anything to the pattern. So, hypoazanthic became the true ghost once it was produced, and hypo-white-sided became the false ghost. But then, to add a little more confusion to the equation, false ghost is also called an ivory bull snake. To try to get rid of the term ghost altogether with this snake, even though they look very similar to the true ghosts, a lot of breeders call these ivories. The last two gene combo I'd like to cover in today's video is the snow morph, or are the snow morphs, because again, there's two, because white-sided versus azanthic comes into play again. Traditionally, in other species of snakes, say hognose snakes, a snow morph is an albino and an azanthic combined. With all black pigmentation being removed thanks to the albino gene, and all yellow pigmentation being removed thanks to the azanthic gene, you're left with essentially a white snake, and they are gorgeous. But just like with the ghosts, the snow, as far as I'm aware, was also produced first using albino and white-sided combined in the bull snake. So this left you with what looked like a snow. It, it, thanks to the azanthic component of the white-sided gene, you had a white snake, so it was called a snow morph. But then once the azanthic gene was discovered and that was combined with albino, that is your traditional snow gene in every other species of snake. So albino and azanthic combined was then coined the snow and albino white-sided was coined a false snow. So it kind of goes along the same lines as false ghost, true ghost. Basically, with these two morphs, if you hear false, it means that white-sided was used for the exanthic component compared to a true exanthic gene. We used to have a couple snows that we produced, and then we decided to trade them for new bloodlines for breeding projects, so I'm just going to be using some bee footage of those snows we produced a couple years ago. Those are all of the two gene combos I'm aware of that have fancy names tied to them. For all of the other two gene combinations that you can come up with or create with bull snakes, say albino patternless or the, the hypo patternless you saw earlier, those are all referred to as the morphs that are involved. So you've got hypo patternless. And now that I think of it, it's a lot of patternless stuff that doesn't have its own unique name when combined with something else. So azanthic patternless, albino patternless, those are all referred to as just what genes are in play. Which honestly would probably be the easiest way to refer to all of the gene combos in bull snakes, instead of using fancy names that may mean one thing or may mean the other, and it gets worse later on, let me tell you, it's probably just easiest to list out all of the genes involved to explain what morph of bull snake you have. Then everyone will all be on the same page. 
page. And now let's move on to probably the most confusing part of this video, three gene combos. Just like with some of the two gene combos, there isn't a fancy name assigned to the combination and instead just the two, or in this case, three genes are listed out individually. But some of them do have fancy names coined to the combination. However, some contradict themselves. For example, you have some bull snakes that are albino, hypo, and patternless, and those are sometimes referred to as sunglows. But if you remember from earlier in this video, hypo and albino is also sometimes referred to as a sunglow. In addition, you can have, and I need a cheat sheet for this because it gets so bad, you can have a patternless albino, a xanthic, white-sided, okay, we're diving into foraging combos now too, and that is sometimes referred to as a blizzard morph bull snake. And they're all white, so I can understand why it's called a blizzard. But you can also have an azanthic albino white-sided, which is also called a blizzard, or a hypo albino white-sided, which is also called a blizzard. So again, it's just easiest to list all the genes individually. For another example, you can have a hypo albino white side, which could be referred to as a white sided hybino or a hypo false snow. Or, you know, it, when you start combining them, it gets really confusing. But some people refer to the hypo albino white sided as a moon glow. And it just gets impossible to keep up with all of these fancy names because they can mean different things. This is one of the adorable baby bull snakes that just hatched over here at Snake Discovery about a week ago. And its genetic makeup consists of hypomelanism albinism and white-sided, or hypo-albino white-sided. That could be referred to as a blizzard. But since there are so many different combinations of genes that are also referred to as a blizzard, if we were to list this one for sale, this one's already sold, but if we were to list it, I would probably say this is a Trumbauer hypo-albino white-sided bull snake. Then everybody knows everything that's involved. They're not expecting patternless because I called it a blizzard and they think blizzard contains patternless and so on. It's just a lot easier to understand. So that's basically the moral of today's video is be open-minded because there might be multiple designer names for combinations of bull snake morphs out there that maybe you know of one but you're not aware of another. So when in doubt, just list off the genes that it has. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed today's video and learned something new. As always, thank you to our amazing and generous Patreon backers for your incredible support on this channel. And since we have not really had a good video to showcase all the morphs of bull snakes that we have like we just did now, let me know which morph is your favorite in the comments below. Since you've just had a chance to see them all, and you can see them all back to back, there might have been one that stood out more than the rest. So I'm always curious, let me know which one was your favorite. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.